Quadratic Functions and Models. The Graph of a Quadratic Function. Let's take a look at the graph of a quadratic function. So a quadratic function, as we know, is a polynomial function. The standard form of the quadratic function is the form f of x is equal ax squared plus bx plus c, where a does not equal 0. Now I want to pause there for a moment before we talk about everything else. I do enjoy the textbook Pre-Calculus 11th edition by Ron Larson. However, I have found that in your textbook, your uh, textbook calls vertex form standard form, which is absolutely incorrect. So the standard form that you see on the screen right now is the correct standard form. When we learn about vertex form in a few moments, that is what your textbook calls standard form, and that is absolutely incorrect. So I'll get off my soapbox now and let's talk about what the graph looks like. So the graph of a polynomial function, I'm sorry, the graph of a quadratic function is a U-shaped graph known as a parabola, as you can see on the screen. The lowest or highest point is called the vertex. So here, when b is 0 and c is 0, so really it's just y equals x squared, the vertex is going to be at 0, 0. Uh, parabolas are symmetric to an invisible line known as the axis of symmetry. So the axis of symmetry is, in this case, x equals 0. And so let me go ahead and make that dotted so we can see this is not a line that we would normally see. We just have a dotted line that says this is the axis of symmetry, which says I could fold it across that axis of symmetry. Um, if a is greater than 0, the parabola points up. So notice I have a is 1, and as I'm uh, moving to the right, it's shrinking. We've already talked about those transformations. But as I go to negative 1, I can see that it's now flipped over. And now, again, I can shrink it or stretch it or so forth. Now, I've made the step just 1 in this case. So if I did want to make the step, say, 0.1, and then I could just press play, and you could see exactly what happens. So as it's closer to 10, it's skinnier as it's closer to zero, it's wider as it flips to the negative side, the graph itself flips upside down. And we could do um, the same with B. We can see what B does to this. And we can see it's sort of bouncing back and forth. Then we can see what C does to this. And C is actually pretty straightforward because C is just going to bring it straight up or straight down. So B is a little bit crazier. Let me go ahead and move this back to 1. Okay, 1 and 0 and 0. And now if I press C, you can see it's just going to go straight up and down. Vertex form of a quadratic function. Now let's take a look at the vertex form of a quadratic function. Now again, keep in mind, your textbook calls the standard form, which is absolutely incorrect. The standard form of a quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c is equal 0, or f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, which is the one that we just looked at. So vertex form. Vertex form is known as vertex form simply because you can look at the function and determine the vertex without doing any work. So as you can see on the screen, I have vertex form in Desmos, and we already know what A is going to do. We've just kind of reviewed that a little bit ago. But let's talk about what H does. H and K is actually the vertex, the X value of the vertex and the Y value of the vertex. So notice what happens if I click the slider on H. It's going to the right. It's going to the left. So that's great, but I do want to point one thing out to you. Notice that the vertex form is X minus H quantity squared. So even though this is, say, positive 2, the function will look like x minus 2. 
So a minus two actually means it's to the right. So just keep in mind that this is a minus. And so for instance, if this was a negative 3.4, it would look like plus 3.4. So always keep in mind that you're going to change the sign um, that it's written for the H value, which is the X value of your vertex. The K value is just the Y value of your vertex. So again, you can go up and down and up and down and so forth. Um, the axis of symmetry is always going to be the line X equals H. And we talked a little bit about the axis of symmetry and how it's just an imaginary line that you can always um, cut that vertex in half right where it is. And of course, it's going to move wherever the vertex is. So you'll notice that the um, X value of the vertex is the same as the X value of the axis of symmetry. Um, we already know about the graph opening up or down. So if I'm on the positive side, the graph's opening up. If I'm on the negative side, the graph's opening down. If I have a number between zero and one, or zero and negative one in this case, it's going to be fatter. As the number gets larger, it's going to be skinnier. Now that we know how helpful vertex form can be, let's talk about how to turn a standard form equation into vertex form. And to do that, we're going to utilize the completing the square method. So if you've never used that before, that's okay. We're going to work through it together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the equation so that my first two terms are together because I want the x squared term and the x term, and I don't want the seven. I'm just gonna leave the seven on the outside. And while I'm doing that, I notice that I have an a value that's not one. So if a is not one, I want you to go ahead and factor that out. So I'm gonna take this divided by two and this divided by two, leaving me with x squared plus four x, and then I'm going to leave a plus blank. And then I'm going to have a plus seven, and then I'm gonna leave a plus and not, I'm sorry, then I'm gonna leave a minus. And normally I would just leave a minus blank, but because I have that leading coefficient of two, it's going to be minus two times blank. So what is the blank going to be? The blank is always going to be B divided by two quantity squared. Well, B used to be eight, but now it's four. So I'm going to take four divided by two quantity squared, which is two squared, which is four. So this value is going to be four and this value is going to be four, but remember this is actually two times four because of the two over here. Now, you might be thinking, why did she call it completing the square? Well, completing the square because now this is a perfect square. I can factor this into X and then whatever sign this is, so this is a plus, and then whatever value I squared, so x plus two quantity squared. Now we're gonna finish writing this and then I'm just going to convince you that this is the correct factorization. Uh, on the outside I have plus seven and then I have minus two times four or minus eight, so I have minus one on the outside. Now let's just make sure we did that right. I turned that into x plus two quantity squared, which is x plus two times x plus two. So if I were to FOIL this out, I would get x squared plus two x plus two x plus four, which is x squared plus four x plus four. So it does make sense that I took this expression, this polynomial and turned it into this binomial quantity squared. So now, that I'm here, I have my original equation in vertex form, and then I have my new equation, I'm sorry, my original equation in standard form, and then my new equation in vertex form. And so using this form, I could say the vertex is negative two, because remember it's always the opposite sign, comma, negative one, the axis of symmetry is x is equal to negative two, the same as the x value there. 
Um, and the direction of opening, because my leading coefficient is positive, that it opens up, and then it's probably a little bit skinnier because that's a number greater than one. Let's pause a moment to do a little practice. So if you would, I would like you to see if you can rewrite this in vertex form and then graph the function. When you're ready, press play to see how you did. So we would begin by rewriting this function. If it has a leading coefficient other than one, which it does, it has a negative one, we will factor that out. And then we will put x squared, and then again, we're dividing by negative one, so now this is minus six x, and then always plus, and always a blank. And then on the outside, I still have minus eight, I didn't have to divide that by negative one. But here, I'm going to subtract, and then I'm going to subtract negative one times blank. And again, the blank is always b, divided by two quantity squared. So B is negative six divided by two quantity squared, negative three squared, which is nine. So this value is going to be nine and this value is going to be nine. And when I rewrite this, I'm going to have X minus three quantity squared. That will give me a positive nine here and a minus 3x minus 3x which turns into minus 6x. The value on the outside I have a minus 8 and a minus negative 1 times 9 so really I'm taking negative 8 plus 9 which means I have plus 1. So here's my function f of x is equal to the quantity or negative 1 times the quantity of x minus 3 squared plus 1. And if I graph that, I can see that positive three, that's the opposite sign of the negative three, comma one is in fact my vertex. It's pointing down because of the negative, but it's neither skinnier or fatter. And if I needed to do the axis of symmetry, that would be the equation x is equal to three. It would go just like this through the center of my vertex. Finding the minimum and maximum values of the graph of a quadratic function. Now that we're familiar with what the graph of a quadratic function looks like, it makes perfect sense that we could easily find a minimum or maximum value, and that is just to find the value of the vertex. So when A is greater than zero, or again, when our graph is pointing up, our graph is going to have a minimum. The minimum is going to be the at the x value but of the y value. So this would be a minimum of 4 at the value x equals 3. If a is less than 0, aka the graph is pointing down, our function is going to have a maximum of k at h so i would say this has a maximum of ne or sorry a maximum of negative one at x equals negative two now if we happen to have a quadratic function that's in standard form and not in vertex form you can either manipulate the function to be in vertex form or you can use the function to find the vertex so the function basically just says take negative b divided by 2a and then plug that value into your function to find the y value. So we've already worked through this and wrote it in standard form and determined that negative two, negative one was the vertex. That's by putting it into vertex form. But let's go ahead and just do this method now. Find the x coordinate by taking negative b divided by two a. So again, a is two b is 8 we don't care what c is because we don't need c negative b would be negative 8 divided by 2 times a which is 2 times 2 so negative 8 over 4 or negative 2. then it says to find the y value simply take f of negative 2 f of whatever you get for the x value so 2 times 2 squared sorry negative 2 squared plus 8 times negative 2 
plus 7. Well, 2 times a negative 2 squared would be 2 times 4, or 8. And then 8 times negative 2 would be negative 16, and then plus 7. If I add all of that up, it's basically 15 minus 16, which is negative 1. And notice I do get the point negative 2, negative 1 using the other method. Let's take a look at just one application question together using the min or max. So we have the path of a baseball that's modeled by a specific quadratic function. One thing I want you to notice about the function is obviously that the leading coefficient is negative. So this makes sense that if I'm dealing with home plate and a pitcher, that it's going to be a parabola shape of throwing the ball. So that's the um, path is modeled by this. Now you can see this is a very, very, very small value. And we know that if it's a value between 0 and 1, that's why it's going to look more like this and less, um, less curvy. So it's not going to go up as high, right? So it makes sense. No matter if it's a good pitcher or not, it's going to have to have a little bit of curve to the ball. And we're looking for what is the height at the very, very highest point. So we have this function where f of x represents the height of the baseball. So this is what we're looking for is f of x. That's what we're solving for. Um, x is the horizontal distance from home plate. So x is going to be this distance from home plate. We're interested in f of x. So if you would, press pause, try this question, see if you can determine the maximum height of the baseball, and then when you're ready, press play to see how you did. So again, I'm just going to be using that vertex formula. Uh, I'm not going to try to turn this into vertex form. It would be a lot of work and completing the square with a very small decimal would probably give me a headache. So I'm just going to use that vertex formula to find the opposite of B over 2A. So the opposite of 1 divided by 2 times negative 0.0032, and I get 156.25. Keep in mind, the meaning of that value is that that's how many feet from home plate the ball is when it reaches its maximum height. And then I'm just going to find f of that value in order to find the maximum height. So my maximum height of the baseball is 81.125 feet, which occurs at 156.25 feet from home plate. Up next is polynomial functions of higher degree.